much and letting people into the room. So um, now I'm going to hand over off to our first uh, short paper from the University of Sheffield. Um, Gavin Boyce and Carmen O'Dell are going to be talking about how academic publishers will make money in an open access environment and why librarians should care. So over to Gavin and Carmen. Hello and thank you for joining our session. So um, over the last few years, um, the demand for open access publication, um, primarily driven by um, research funders, has led to a series of developments in the scholarly communications arena. These include the creation of read and publish deals um, for journal articles, the launch of Plan S, and the, relate, and the proliferation of a whole series of new models for the publication of materials open access, particularly um, um, with respect to monographs. So in this session today, we're going to be examining what these developments might mean for the relationship between libraries, publishers and researchers in the future, and what, if anything, libraries should be doing about it. So we're going to look at what's the situation in the scholarly communications at the moment, what is the publishing environment that Plan S is hoping to achieve, and where do libraries fit in with that picture? So, um, by scholarly communications, we just mean the, um, the environment and the methods by which researchers share their work, and then where libraries intersect with that. So I've listed a series of key trends in the area, um, and the first, of course, is the growth of open access. Um, if you look at any recent reports, regardless of their stance on open access, they all agree that a lot of research is now available open access. Earlier this year, a report by the Publishers Association estimated that the proportion of research that's available open access um, has risen from 12% in 2012 up to 38% in the years 2015 to 2018. In a study published last year in Peer J, um, they looked at outputs from universities worldwide, they looked at more than 900, and discovered that 34% of those outputs were open access. And the diagram on the screen shows the split by how those open accesses, the routes that were used to achieve that. So you've got that a third of the outputs were made open access by the gold route, that's by being published in a fully open access journal. 16% were in hybrid journals, and that's basically journals which are still subscription in order to read them, but the publishers allow authors to make individual articles open access on payment of a fee. And then another 20% were available via what's called the bronze route. And this is where it's the publishers have chosen to make an article open access um, or make it freely available rather on their journal website, but without an open access license. So this means that the sharing and reuse of that license is limited and also they can put it back behind the paywall um, at any time that they want. So that's not considered really true open access. More than three quarters, 77% of the articles were in repositories, but some of those articles were ones which were published by the gold hybrid routes as well, which is why there's an overlap. Um, it's important to understand the power relationship um, with these different routes. It's only publishers who can decide if a journal is going to offer gold, hybrid or bronze open access, but researchers themselves can choose to put their articles into repositories, albeit that they um, are probably required by funders to do so now, and also it's the publishers who determined what version of the article they can put in and how soon that can be made available in the repository. So the next important development has been the rise of what are called transitional agreements with publishers. And these are basically just an extension of the um, old big deal agreements that we had for journal subscriptions, but now they tag on an agreement that institutions can also publish so many articles open access as part of that deal. Um, they usually have some kind of restrictions on the total number and they also usually are restricted to specific types of material. The other um, trends on this slide are not new at all, um, but they are still very significant. There's a continuing increasing cost for institutions. Um, UK universities continue to have extreme budgetary pressures and simultaneously there is still the continued profitability of academic publishing in this environment. So there are now 
many, many models um, that have been developed and are continuing to be developed for um, producing and financing open access publication. Um, and if you look at the Opera's white paper, um, that has a good overview if you're interested in specific details and models. But irrespective of the particular schemes, the issues for libraries um, are how can or should a library um, support all these different models? And if they do, how can they make them understandable, easy to use and appealing for their researchers so that they can and want to engage with them? So, um, Plan S um, has a different vision for publishing to the one we've got at the moment. Um, it, has a, it was created by a coalition of international research funders and it has a very simple aim. It wants to make all research available on publication fully open access. Um, as well as increasing access to research, it wants to curtail the sp spiralling costs of publications so that it can free up money um, for actual research. And essential to this is the idea um, that they want signatories to commit to the principles in the Declaration on Research Assessment. And that essentially just says that it's when you are evaluating research, you need to look at the content of the article or the research itself and not judge it by the, art, the journal that it is being published into. And actually, this is probably the most significant and essential factor to Plan S success, because there are many, many journals that, ac that academics and authors could publish in at the moment, and they would be Plan S compliant. But they are not going to want to do that if they think that their article or their work will be in some way judged as more inferior because it hasn't been put into a uh, prestigious, high name, big impact journal. But the consequence of um, institutions and funders no longer relying on the journal impact factor as a way of evaluating research is that then you need to find other tools and methods to do so. And also as publications increase and the number of different models and platforms increase, then you need to have new and better tools to be able to identify high quality um, and relevant sources easily and efficiently. So the Plan S aim is that they will remove the incentive to publish in the, the prestigious name journals, which will incentivize authors to use lower cost um, options. And that in turn will free up money for publications um, and for research um, from libraries and from institutions. So where have libraries got to in terms of um, achieving this? Well, for the last few years, we've been very much preoccupied with the big deal, with the big deals, with organising the read and publish deals that we need to get through. But we're on to arguably the last one, which is the Elsevier negotiations. So now we need to think about where are we going to be after that? Because by getting those deals through and sorted, we're now several steps further towards the Plan S um, utopian model. But I'm now going to pass on to my colleague who will argue why this might not actually be a very good idea. Thank you, Colin. That's literally a seamless segue between presenters. Okay, so uh, in the Plan S Utopia, uh, we have free access to the outputs of research. So I've been asking a question um, over the last year or so, who's going to pay for all this? Um, and when it comes down to the publishers, how are the publishers going to make money? Now, whenever I ask this question, uh, and I'm talking with librarians, quite often the answer is, well, I don't really care. Um, usually this is born of a, um, a response or a feeling that publishers have been making quite a lot of money recently anyway. Uh, but actually, it's, it's quite an important question. If we just break it down very fundamentally, currently, A, the institutions pay. They pay for big deals or smaller deals. Um, and it's usually a bundle of some description. Um, we're moving to a pay to publish situation. And I think we can all start to see that there's going to be pressure on that model. OK, typically the things that are mentioned here are issues about academic choice and also repurposing of a budget. A budget, remember, that is currently defined in most universities as the content and collections budget. It's not going to be that anymore. It's more a, a publishing and collections budget. 
Okay, so the other alternatives to the current situation where the institution pays are that the funder pays. And this year we have seen that the UKRI have upped the amount of money. So the, the amount of money they paid in 2021, 20, you can see from that link there, was around about 23 million. And they have, uh, they have announced in their policy recently that they're going to up that to 46. So they're effectively doubling the amount of money they pay for open access publishing. That's merely a temporary measure. Nobody thinks that's going to continue. Remember, one of the Plan S objectives okay, is, to, is to ensure that most of the funding goes towards research, and not the publishing of research outputs. So let's, let's break this down. Let's look at author pays. And we do actually see this quite a lot already. We see authors paying their own um, uh, APCs. But if the institutions that have signed up to DORA truly commit to the DORA principles, and reduce some of the uh, benefits of publishing in uh, big name journals, then in theory, you should see the pressure for the author to pay to be in nature and whatever um, reduced. So perhaps not also given that we have uh, the increasing budgetary pressures, I can see that one not working either. Well, the other alternative is that it's free, but as we all know, nothing is truly free. And the old adage is, if you're not paying for a product, you are the product. So let's look at some revenue models for publishers here. There's the freemium version. So that's where you get something for free, but actually the, but the value added benefits require you to uh, join up or sign up to something, pay a bit extra. Um, faculty opinions, which used to be uh, F100, um, the F100 freemium version is now called Faculty Opinions. If you have a look at that, it's a perfect example. You, you, it's open access. Um, it's, it's free open access. But in order to get the add-on add um, benefits, you have to pay. Um, for, for Faculty Opinions, that's an awful lot of um, people's responses to the publications. Uh, a second version, revenue model, is bundling. Um, I don't think I need to say too much about bundling because we in libraries have been well aware of publishers bundling for some time. What I will say is that bundling doesn't just have to be content. Bundling can be different, um, it's different products. Um, I think one of the, uh, the examples here is uh, from Elsevier's recent uh, Dutch um, uh, agreement where they uh, asked the, the Dutch universities to pick up something as well as just the content. Uh, and C is leveraging of proprietary data. Um, I've made a, a, a couple of uh, references here, and I, I urge you to have a look at that data tracking research, which is a briefing uh, paper of the Committee on Scientific Library Services uh, in Germany. Uh, it's very interesting, and there is a significant amount of concern about that. Um, I'll move on because I'm running out of time here. What we are looking at here in terms of the publishers is that they are moving across a number of different uh, areas. So this is a lovely uh, article here for coming out of Spark in 2019, shows you Clarivate, Digital Science and Elsevier and the products that they uh, come out, they have currently in the marketplace and where they kind of work in the workflow. So there's research intelligence solutions, research intelligence for funders, research intelligence for gov governments, and research productivity tools. And you can see that they're kind of, they're stretching this, the products are stretched out across um, a number of different areas. Um, this is cashing out Lorcan and Dempsey's phrase, workflow is the new content. Now, I have no problem with any of this. Um, I am not, uh, and nor are we as librarians, anti-profit, but we should be pro-transparency. We do welcome innovation and improvement, and we shouldn't have a problem with a reasonable return on investment for those who invest in such development. But we don't want to lose influence, and that is where we should care. Because we face the possible, the very really real possibility of a loss of decision-making control. Some of the decisions that we make in libraries now may well not be our domain anymore. If the products and services that we're engaging with are across a number of different workflows throughout the university, it will be the university that makes that decision. Um, that may not be a problem, but if it's combined with a loss of ability to add value and a loss of relevance, 
this is why we should care. We do have value to add, and some of these uh, some of these products and services will basically could bypass what we do. And I've uh, I put a little quote there from a lovely paper from uh, our high school uh, folks here in Sheffield, and it's a lovely quote, so I'll read it out. There's a real possibility. They were looking, by the way, at artificial intelligence and how artificial intelligence is being used by uh, commercial organizations. There is a real possibility that most innovative developments might be undertaken by commercial organizations, which will inevitably attempt to monetize products and services, and it may dominate the landscape with libraries having limited bargaining power or even losing their role entirely. So there's 10 minutes remaining, including questions. OK, thank you. Um, I thought I'll put this, I'll, I'll finish up quickly now. Um, this is a, this diminished role of libraries is echoed in a number of other places. Uh, this is out recently, which is a, a lovely Ithaca paper. Again, I urge you to have a look at that. Um, and I would just like to reprise the uh, question that came from our keynote from Andrew Barker, which is what the hell is a library for? We looked at this in Sheffield uh, some years ago, and we came up with uh, what we called the wheel of value. And we said the university library facilitates intellectual discovery and knowledge creation by, and we noted four different ways. Now, this was from responses we did with interviews uh, of academics in, in our university. And you can see that the four different ways, this is a general categorization of the responses, the four different ways we can see that there is uh, if not conflict, there is certainly, um, if you like, uh, competition with commercial organisations in how they add value in that workflow. OK, I have some suggestions about what we can do, um, and I'll leave those in in uh, the slide for people to, uh, to consider. It kind of depends what your um, institution focus is, um, but also um, I would just like to say, as so we close off, uh, that there are a number of different things you could get organised into. So there's the Research on Research Institute, uh, which is across a number of different institutions. And in Sheffield, we have our own MetaNet, which is looking at uh, the research environment as a whole and how it can be sustainable in a Plan S utopia. Uh, I'll stop there. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Gavin and Carmen. Um, so I invite questions on this uh, very interesting topic and very timely as well. So if you could put your hand up or if you're unable to type, type a question in the chat. So I can kick off. Um, so you had on your last slide there, Gavin, um, around raising awareness. Um, do you do those sort of outreach with um, the academics in your institution, um, just raising awareness of sort of the issues that libraries are facing at the moment? Because obviously they have those different contacts with publishers, don't they? When they're, you know, uh, peer reviewing and, and when they're on um, journal boards and stuff. Yes, yeah, so I will say that I think we're blessed here at Sheffield with a, uh, a very engaged uh, academic community. Not all, because no, no academic community is, is entirely homogenous, but we do have certainly a um, number of very significant um, uh, research groups looking at. So I mentioned the Research on Research Institute, um, in which uh, our James Wilson is, is very prominent. Uh, but we also have a rather more specific um, Sheffield University Metanet, which is uh, very keen. And we have the iSchool, which is, I mean, we've got Stephen Pinfield and Andrew Cox, who are uh, putting an awful lot of research effort into this. So it, it's very much a partnership between the library here and our academic community. Um, so uh, we are blessed and we have a number of committees. Um, Carmen sits on our, I think it's called ORAG now, yes. isn't it? And ORAG stands for Carmen? The um... Open Research Advisory uh, Group? Yes. That's my <laughs> best guess. There you go. Um, so uh, yeah, advocacy at, the, at that level, working with uh, academics, partnering with academics, but we also do not uh, miss the opportunity to respond to inquiries with very fulsome answers. Um, I don't know if anybody's seen our FAQs on our Elsevier consultation, but um, well, I think they're being cribbed. I don't think we actually put them out under CCBY, but we should have done. Are you, are you able to share those in the chat? I'm, I'm sure that lots of people will be interested in those. Uh, uh, Carmen will uh, answer the next question and I will endeavour to do that very thing. 
Okay, so um, I invite other questions. Okay. Um, is there is there anything that you didn't get to cover um, in in the paper that you think it's worth highlighting, Carmen and Gavin? Not to put you on the spot or anything. Um, no, probably not in 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 this context of this actual presentation. But if there's anybody on the call who's particularly into, interested in trans transitional agreements and how well or not they're working, then please get in touch with me afterwards because I'm quite keen to discuss that at length with anyone who will listen to my rants about the efficacy. <laughs> okay, we have we have a question. Ellie, please do go ahead and put on your mic and ask your question. Thanks, Gavin and Carmen. That was absolutely, absolutely brilliant and really timely. Um, I was at the um, armour discussion yesterday about um, the uh, UK new UKRI policy and and monographs um, and went to the one on on uh, e-journal uh, articles um, a week or so ago and I just think that the amount of change that there is in Carmen I am very interested in talking to you about transitional agreements and, <laughs> and whether or not they're working I think everything that you picked out in the presentation it's not really a question I've got it's just a it was really, really interesting and really timely. And thank you so much for all the for all the links so that I can kind of go away and, and read up more because I'm just feeling like there's so much around the shift in where the funding is coming from for for scholarly publishing that we need to wrestle with as institutions, whether we're research research intensive or not so research intensive. So you've given me an awful lot to think about and an awful lot to go up and go and read and just wanted to say a big thank you for that. Well, thank you. <laughs> Fabulous. Thank you so much. OK, last call for questions. I have posted a link in the chat there. Thank you so much, Gavin. Yes, you've got getting lots of thumbs up for that. Um, I'm sure lots of people will, that, will find that very, very interesting and useful. OK, well, um, thank you very much, um, Gavin and Carmen. I'm going to move on now to our um, second short paper, again from the University of Sheffield. Uh, we have Peter Barr and Nagas Kolazade. Um, who are going to be talking about writing the University of Sheffield's comprehensive content strategy. Uh, so over to you. Okay, uh, yeah, uh, good afternoon everyone. Nagas is in control of the slides, is setting it up. So just while that happens, I'd just like to um, endorse a Carmen broadside about uh, transitional agreements, if you've got time to hear one there. They're very, very well worth your time. Um, yeah, so what's better than one University of Sheffield presentation, two University of Sheffield presentations? We're going to talk to you about writing the University of Sheffield's comprehensive content strategy. Uh, I'm Pete. My job title is Head of Content and Collections, but I was the project lead for this project. Yeah, hello, everyone, and welcome to our session today. My name is Nargis Kalhorzadeh. I'm a library information advisor at the University of Sheffield, and I was library project support officer for the content strategy. OK, so um, the basic outline is we're going to discuss a little bit of the background to the strategy. We're going to really talk to you about the method of how we wrote it and then we'll do some reflections on that process. I suppose what I just wanted to highlight at this point is the strategy is published. So this this talk, we're very proud of the strategy we've produced, but this talk is really about how you kind of go about writing these sort of strategic level papers. Uh, and so it's more focused on the process than the, the strategy itself. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. 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 Background. Yeah. Before going through the background, what we have done to write the University of Sheffield Comprehensive Content Strategy, there is the strategy approved text to be taken forward for ratification to the University Teaching and Learning Committee, which is available through this link at the University of Sheffield Library website. The slides are going to be shared with you after the conference. Also, our session abstract and relevant documents regarding what we are, we are going to talk about in this session are available in the details at the Humanities Commons website through this link in this slide. 
So before we kind of get into talking about how we wrote, I think it's just worth acknowledging that around university policy documents, there's a kind of fatigue and a cynicism that exists. So yeah, I think, you know, it's right to ask the question of whether policy documents, even with quite kind of radical and forthright language, are tools for change or actually a kind of justification of the status quo. So, you know, just, just for context, I sit here waiting to be balloted by my trade union branch about a failure of our university to live up to part of its uh, supposed university vision. But not to digress too much on that, the, the kind of, I suppose our point of view is that this is the bureaucratic structure we live in. So without some sort of statement of intent, some sort of strategic document, um, it's very hard to achieve things in the context of the kind of the modern UK university. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, and just for some of the background, so this isn't fundamentally a kind of COVID story. This was a kind of new beginning that began uh, before lockdown. So obviously, as we'll get to, that kind of impacted on what we did. But just to kind of clarify, this was the last outstanding action of our old strategic plan. And I joined Sheffield in 2016 as a liaison librarian. And for much of that period, there was kind of this culture of any difficult activity or the decision we had to be made kind of being said, oh, well, the content strategy will solve that and kind of being parked there. And what you ended up with was, A, this ridiculously high expectation that the content strategy would solve everything and a kind of this feeling that the complexity was holding it back. So you can even, you know, we do not, for example, define content as the content that we produce in our tutorials and support, but you could. So you've got to come up with these kind of definitions. And what we... What we kind of saw is that in the absence of a strategy, people were kind of trying to build up policies from the bottom. And then what you had is policies in several different teams clashing with each other. And everything that kind of Carmen and Gavin had just told you about transformational agreements just kind of arose during this period. You needed some sort of overarching document to cover it. Next slide. Sorry, timeline. The original timeline and method of communication have been affected by the pandemic from March 2020 due to changes in the university and the library priorities and accessibility to the stakeholders, which caused delay in progression of the project. And we were ratifying the final text now in September 2021. Method. About uh, staff consultation, we decided to do presentation sessions for the library staff at the beginning of the project to introduce the project and collect the library staff ideas and feedback to these two questions. Through a Padlet online board and transferring the result to a spreadsheet as a method of consultation. Practical question in response to what practical question are you expecting the content strategy to answer? We received 70 responses from a broad to very specific questions. A few examples are here and full responses, responses are available on the shared document. Also, we managed to categorize the responses to things based on how relevant those responses were to the content and collection internal departments. Values. In response to what principles and values would you like to see at the heart of the strategy? We received 24 responses. We highlighted them to the following themes such as openness, ethics, accessibility, open access, etc. Um, yeah, obviously we're librarians, so we had to do a literature review. I think what what's quite um, what's quite liberating about doing a literature review in this context, if you're about to do one for a dissertation, is you don't have to do something that's kind of massively comprehensive. And as kind of Nagas has said, what we wanted to do is really frame this in what would be a useful operational document for the library staff. The point of the literature review was really to kind of connect those practical and kind of aspirational things in our library staff with the wider debate and also to prepare us for a consultation with our community of users about what we were doing. So in the past, perhaps when we have tried to consult too broadly with our user group, we've ended up with quite reductive ideas of what the library can do. So this was to kind of give us the evidence base of what, what you know, what was and wasn't achievable. Um, and I think, you know, the, the kind of main reflections of this is that, you know, we are very much, we are very much kind of uh, restricted by the kind of 
uh, commercial environment that we live in uh you know ebooks have disappointed us tell me about it next slide please um so yeah we're restricted by the environment and the kind of legislative environment as well and i think the other thing that's happened is that for a long time perhaps libraries have been applied trying to kind of retrofit analog print collection and content development or access to content things onto a kind of hybrid collection that's e and print at the same time and what you've ended up with and again this lies at the heart of what uh, Gavin and Carmen were talking to you about is that a lot much most of our budget is committed to buying these big journal packages that are the same and you lead to this idea again it's another law condemns the idea of kind of isomorphism that all the big university libraries kind of are a bit the same but it within them is all this unique content and our effort to kind of surface that and to show that has been lost in automated techniques so there's a kind of role for curation coming back into the library uh, next slide all right, about uh, sector scanning, we have looked to other institutions, especially the Russell Group universities, to see what they have done regarding their content and collection policies and or if they have any content strategy, especially for the recent years. The focus and highlights of our finding were about improving library management system, discovery system, acquisition processes, reviewing and updating the collections and library policies and working with users. Also, one of the good examples we could find in the UK was the University of West London content strategy for 2018 to 2023, available through this link. The focus on the strategy was about principles, collection development, collection management, partnership, interlending and document delivery research and open access publishing and archives and special collections. Based on what we have done through previous stages that were explained through this session, such as literature review and staff consultation, we created a framework and the internal consultation group made the comments and ideas on it and the final framework as shown in here, was set for the next stage of the project. So yeah, so kind of as Nagy said, the first phase was very much as understanding what the content, uh, what the comprehensive content strategy had to do. Then what we did is we kind of, with the framework, we had to kind of go about populating it. And before we started trying to kind of write a, a draft to present it for consultation, we kind of did three pieces of work. So one is we turned all those practical examples that we've shown you into an, a series of case studies with the idea that these are not necessarily things that we wanted to do. I suppose these are like a low rent version of that kind of provocation that was very popular a while ago. But these were things that kind of if you wanted to do them now, the current the current kind of policy as much as we had one wouldn't let you do it and if I would just highlight that support publishing initiatives that may not immediately benefit our community when I was a liaison librarian I once had an idea that we should double our our contribution to the open library of humanities we should become like a premium contributor or whatever it was called at the time and the response I was given was that I needed to write a a business case to present to our senior leadership team and because that money was coming out of, again, as Gavin kind of alluded to earlier, the content budget, saying we just want to double a contribution for an open access thing that doesn't turn a thing into a thing we own and that we can't directly map to kind of student outcomes meant that it failed. So what we what we there had was a kind of failure of our policy and our internal kind of processes to allow us to actually do the things that we were at least not notionally saying we supported in open access. Next slide. The other thing we did is we wrote a basically what we call a dummy strategy. So we did this, to, you know, essentially to throw it away. And the idea was not to fixate on the individual words in it and actually what it was saying, but to just reflect upon, upon the kind of language itself. And I think if you summarize that, it's we wanted it to be inclusive. So we wanted it to be a document that, uh, although it was for library operational purposes, belonged to our user community as much as us, that it was intelligible, you know to people who didn't work in libraries so we kind of use lay terms and that and that it wasn't you know 
you know, our criticism of many existing strategies is they're quite woolly and vague. So we wanted to get rid of as of as many wherever possible, if appropriate, as necessary, and make kind of definitive, bold statements. Next slide. And the third part, you know, before we began the drafting process and the consultation process, is we thought about the elements of the of the plan, and we thought which elements did we want to basically present as a kind of, you know, this is what we think should happen. Which did we want to say, this is what we think should happen, do you agree? Where did we want to present a number of different options to our user group and which ones did we want to kind of seek open-ended questions? So we kind of attributed every section of the framework to one of these things. In reality, kind of COVID got in the way and we were much more in the kind of, here's what we think, do you agree? But I think that piece of work and whether we've been able to do it is a kind of interesting question to ask ourselves. Next slide. And the next one. So just sort of generally reflecting on that process, again, this this you know, this may be a relatively obvious point, but you kind of need to keep your senior leadership team, your director, uh, on board. So you need a kind of level of you know, a top level buy-in. Um, what you what you you know, it's very kind of tempting to present to them very, very radical visions, but you've got to understand the context in which uh, your senior leadership team work. And part of the process is to kind of push them, to challenge them, to see if they can go further, but also to understand that if you kind of write them a strategy that says we're going to cancel all our major journal subscriptions by January, that they're not going to, that's not going to be politically tenable within your institution. So a, a key stakeholder group that is kind of slightly hidden from the process we've shown uh, is your senior leadership team. And equally, I think you need to, like, this is not a strategy that Nargis and me wrote and it's just everything that we reckon. This is this is us trying to bring together all the kind of knowledge and aspiration of our library colleagues and to con, you know, consult and try and reflect as much as possible the views and the needs of our user group. In this instance, we were writing a content strategy. So it was you had to kind of stay focused on the things that were in and out of your thing, of your policy. And that's what all that kind of initial phase was about establishing. Equally, and this was sort of more of a problem for me, uh, the Nagas is, is this is not just a kind of strategy for my content and collections team. This is a thing that cuts into the scholarly communications team. It, it kind of relates to how we do information literacy because that's a way of providing access to the strategy, uh, sorry, to content. And I think the, uh, yeah, staying conceptual is hard is the final point in that. So for a lot of the things where we were doing the case studies or where we were doing dummy strategies, it was easy for the debate to become lost in like, you know, should we do this? Should we not do this? And it's like, we're not talking about that at that stage. We're talking, could we do this? And would this document allow us to do it? Uh, next slide. So there's 10 minutes remaining, including questions. OK, we've got two more slides. We shouldn't be too slow. Um, this this slide is just really so I've kind of alluded to this before is that what we had hoped to do is with when we'd actually the initial consultation plan included a phase, I suppose, before drafting that involved us going and asking those more open ended questions like how you expect the library to use its influence, which user groups are there beyond the university that you expect thing us to kind of support that we really wanted to do some work with and that, you know, just because of how available people were and just, I suppose, how much kind of mental headspace people had for this we decided to go for a kind of more cut down version i think ultimately what we've ended i don't think that's damaged kind of the kind of intellectual integrity of the document that we've come up with but i think that kind of you really want this document to be kind of bought in as much as possible now it's kind of one of them open-ended questions i suspect if we'd done a kind of hard push and town hall meetings and that kind of stuff i don't think we would have had rooms packed full of 200 people but it is interesting that we we lost that and i suppose we're still very happy with what we've produced and we've still got i think what we wanted which is a document that marries high-minded principle with kind of operational integrity. But um, yeah, that consultation was missed there. Next slide. And just to talk about kind of how it's being used now. So this is the classic conference presentation in that we've completed the strategy and we're in the process of kind of implementing what it is. So we're at the point where obviously it's going to be a wild success, but we can't, we can't prove it to you at this stage. But we are beginning to kind of rethink about our acquisitions policies right we're beginning to kind of reframe them in the light of what that what the strategy lays out and i think where it's become useful is in the strategy itself there's a kind of 
um, well, there's a very explicit statement about being transparent. And part of that transparency is actually the strategy itself allows us to kind of communicate to our users the decisions we're making and why. And Nargis has got a couple of examples that she can kind of share around that. Yeah, for example, uh, regarding user communication, there were the situation that academic staff and university students had question regarding the format of the requested resources from the library, which came through to the library faculty engagement team and the customer services team. As there is a clear strategy regarding access to content within our content strategy, which in, in case was a digital format, the query were the queries were responding quickly and very there were very good communication between library member of the staff as well. Yeah, and I think where we're going with it next is all you know it, it's in it's in our kind of operational plan for next year and it will be incorporated into the the new you know library like grand operational plan that's coming uh, shortly uh, so we're getting our teams to kind of reflect on how much their processes embody what the content strategy says out and then i suppose the next step after that is to look at kind of action plans of how we can begin to kind of align our processes much more clearly the other thing that I'm kind of hoping it will be useful for is I think it's a very clear statement of what we are trying to do with the content budget, I suppose, primarily. And that that kind of um, enables our conversation with with publishers. So if we're challenged, if they are kind of want to be the kind of partners in the research process that a lot of their rhetoric claims, here's a description of how we would like them to help us. If they can, if they can show how they kind of meet into that strategy, that's great. If they don't, then that's where we have to kind of start making difficult decisions. And again, in an era before you have such a written document, all of these things are just vaguely aspirational and nothing gets done. So we are yeah, we are confident that this will this will be a relatively transformative document in the way in the way we do uh, business at the University of Sheffield. Next slide. So that's uh, yeah, that concludes what we're going to say. Thank you for your time. Excellent. Thank you so much, Pete and Nargis. Um, and now I invite people to ask questions about this. Um, yeah, really fascinating topic. I feel inspired now actually to think about our own collection. Um, development policy. So if you could put your hand up if you have a question. So Sally, you were first. Go ahead, please. Hang on a sec, I'm just starting my camera <laughs> so you can see me. I always think that helps. So hi everyone, um, I'm Sally Halper and I'm the Head of Content Strategy at the British Library and uh, welcome to my small bungalow because I'm working from home today. Um, so yeah, my um, question really for Pete and Naga is um, I share your pain um, being the author of the British Library's Content Strategy. And I wondered um, if you'd had any trouble yet um, with actually people adopting what you'd written. Have you had any feedback along the lines of we're just not sure how this is going to work in practice or is it too early a stage yet to be able to tell if you'll meet much resistance on the ground? So I suppose we can both answer it in different ways like so in, in my team which is kind of acquisitions and collection management mm. I would say it is probably too early. I think a lot of people agree with the principles, but they're worried that a lot of this involves is almost deliberately taking the hard option, which obviously mm -hmm. has a, has a effect on people's operational kind of thing. So I don't believe everyone is 100% bought in to it, but I don't think anybody, I don't think anybody sort of fundamentally disagrees. I, I suppose more on the kind of customer service faculty engagement side, mm -hmm. Nug has been there. Um, I don't, I don't know if you've got a feel for the for the overall feeling. So it's the same as I gave an example. There was the situation mm -hmm. that because the staff start to look into it, I mean, sometimes they still don't know that it's available to mm -hmm. look at it, to get back to their customers. And uh, for example, because I was working with faculty engagement, and with customer service team, myself mentioned it to them. Did you look at the content strategy? It's, it's already there. So I think uh, because uh, for this year is in our uh, staff development program, each member of library staff, they need to 
consider content strategy as one of their objective, mm. what they can okay. do regarding that. So it's going to mm. be the beginning of the journey. That's really helpful. Thank you. And it'd be really helpful to stay in touch after today as well, because sure. I find your presentation really interesting and a lot of similarities that I could talk to you a lot more about offline another time. So, um, yeah, that would be great. Um, and I'll pop a link in chat to our content strategy as well for colleagues if you wanted to have a look at our guiding principles, because we did work quite hard on that as a collaborative exercise. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sally. Yes, thank you, Sally, for doing that. And if anybody else wants to share theirs as well, please do pop them in the chat, the more the merrier. Um, Kirsten, please, please do go ahead. Thanks, Helen. Uh, Peter and Nogus, thanks. That was really, really interesting. Uh, I'm based at the University of Hull, working in the research services team. So um, very much uh, coming at this this kind of conversation from a, a perspective of somebody involved in, in the uh, um, the publishing side of, of collection development rather, rather than content in the library. And uh, um, I'm just wondering if you have a schedule for um, reviewing your, your published strategy or a process for that in mind. So yeah, it's very much the intention that this is not a monolithic document. So university strategy changes, government policy changes, uh, that the library strategy changes. So, we haven't, I suppose, explicitly said, but I think implied is that once a year we are going to take a look at, we have a, a kind of relatively high level library group called the Collections Advisory Group. So we will we'll be reviewing it there and making sure it kind of still embodies what we're doing. And I suppose what we've also done related to that is in that group, we've tacked on a statement to kind of at the end of every kind of uh, meeting minutes to consider whether we've taken any steps that have kind of cut across what we've said in the in the content strategy so it's we're trying to kind of really uh, embed it and yeah review annual review is it mm -hmm. it's not explicit but it's definitely part of what we're intending to do brilliant thank you that's really interesting that was going to be my question as well <laughs> OK, um, so we have come to the end of the time. Um, I want to thank again our four presenters from the University of Sheffield, Gavin, Carmen, Nargis and Pete. Um, and I've just got a few things to uh, let you know about. Um, so Rose's um, closing remarks will be in 10 minutes um, at half past. Um, for ease, I'm just going to pop in the link um, to the actual room into uh, the chat. Um, you can also find it in the timetable to to make things easier for you um, to access. Um, and at the closing remarks, Rosie will be announcing uh, the winners of the sponsor treasure hunt um, and those wonderful prizes um, and also the winner of the quiz. And um, so please do go along. Um, and we'd also love to hear um, how your views on the conference and um, how it's been for you so please do fill in the feedback form which you can find in the channel in teams and it will also be emailed to you after the event um, so all that remains for me is to thank you um, thank you thank you to our presenters and thank you very much for everybody who attended um, and uh, yeah i uh, i will see you um, around and about i'm sure okay bye everybody